A big welcome back to our next presenter, Mitch Bach, who participated in the inaugural event last year. He's been keeping himself busy in the interim, not only driving forward the, his own trip school business, but also joining some other well-known industry members and take the reins of the popular operator community tourpreneur. So, now what? This time, Mitch is going to be answering one of the most commonly asked questions of the tourpreneur community, how to get products online, and choose the best systems and strategies for distribution. Over to you, Mitch. <laughs> Look at the floor, he's exhausted. Hello, everyone, and a huge thank you to To Our Radar and the entire multi-day operator and industry community for putting on this event. I can't tell you how needed it is to bring together us as an industry in similar ways that other verticals get brought together so that we can showcase just how special we are and the kinds of adventures and experiences that we make are so meaningful. So I'm really thankful to be here. The last time I was here, I talked about designing a tour for a phenomenal wow effect to bring back your customers as uh, raving fans. In this part two, I'm really going to focus now on your digital strategy, on the way in which you take that fantastic experience that you've created and bring it into an online world that is incredibly busy, incredibly competitive, and land what are ultimately what you want, which are fantastic uh, customers. So on the next slide, you're going to see, first of all, that I do want to call back to what is at the heart of what we do as operators. I've spent 20 years now in this industry as a multi-day operator across Europe, across the United States, and also as a tour manager. I got my start with boots on the ground, uh, leading groups around and watching what makes them come alive. And this photo here on the right just is a reminder, almost a daily reminder of me of why I do this job. It was a tour that I led many years ago. It was a chapel that we were in, in, in a church in South Carolina, and the piano was open. I sat down, I played that piano, and I played Amazing Grace. It was a song that's traditional in America. You play it in churches. And one of the women broke down crying, and it was because she told me that that was the song that her mother had asked uh, that be played at her funeral. And she passed away just before the two women said, I've been looking for some sort of sign that I should be on this trip and not, and not grieving for my mother. And she said, you know, this little moment is what has made me realize that I can say goodbye to my mother. Every year, she still sends me a birthday card. She still sends me a note saying, you helped me give my mother the goodbye that she deserved. And uh, we are in the moment making business. Before we all get so wrapped up in the world of online digital sales strategy, of OTAs, of business, 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 I hope that we spend uh, at least as much time in our lives crafting the experiences that build that community. And if you go to the next slide now, you're going to see that so many of the ways that we as multi-day experience creators acquire our customers and maintain our customers is through community. Uh, events, trade shows, sometimes it's just that one-on-one -on -one phone calls that you make to keep people in the loop. Facebook groups are such a powerful way of acquiring customers. And then there's also, of course, the online world of your website. Uh, all of these things are really just different ways of us beginning to build a tribe, beginning to connect with groups that we're going to take around the world. Now, the question is, of course, and this is what we're going to focus on today. Next slide. How do you sell to these customers? How do these become people that actually book with you? And really in the digital space, in the online world, you have two choices. It's either direct and it's otherwise through some sort of third party intermediary. What I want to break down is how we can develop an online sales strategy sort of around these two prongs. And the first one, we all know it, but I do want to just take a moment and recognize its complexity. When you are selling direct, and it's often seen as the holy grail, the, the thing we're all trying to hope for, 
it requires a phenomenally converting website, fantastic booking software that creates a seamless customer journey that connects with a CRM and email marketing and social media and PPC strategy that keep your customers in the loop. In other words, you're creating a digital ecosystem that if one of those little moments fails can mean the loss of your customers. And this happens all the time. I see websites that are so difficult to book or ultimately require a phone call, or I see digital marketing strategies that aren't connecting on a real brand storytelling level. There are so many of these little moments along the way that can, that can cause interference in your customer journey. The third party, this is an OTA, this is an online travel agent or a digital partner of another, of another sort are really going to be the other route in which you are partnering with someone to do that sales and marketing work for you. In exchange, they take a little cut. For those of you new to, I think, this sort of online sales world, I do want to take a moment and talk about how hard it is to connect directly with the customer. It's, 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 it's great when it works, but this next slide here, you're going to see the weaving road across the moment that a customer begins to be aware of you and up until that little green moment when they make a booking with you. At the start, they are connecting with you through awareness campaigns. It goes through email marketing, through Google search ads, through everything from review solicitation and, re and, 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 and selling to your blogging strategy, your media strategy, into a fantastically honed e-commerce experience in your website. That customer journey is busy, it's getting busier, and everything on that weaving snake of a customer journey map uh, costs you as the operator, as the experience creator, both time and money. On the next slide, I do want to mention that also on the customer facing side, it's becoming harder and harder to be a customer. Being a customer is difficult because First of all, you're stuck in the depths of search hell. You are searching across sometimes hundreds of websites. Uh, as you find operators, you're constantly asking yourself, is this a website? Is this an operator that I trust? Is this my tribe? Is this the kind of group that I want to be a part of? Is this the best price? Is this an easy customer journey in terms of me reaching out to this operator and making a booking? And this has become incredibly difficult, both in the multi-day world and in the day tour world uh, in our industry, as experienced creators have proliferated. The internet has created a sort of new exploded world of understanding just how many experiences there are out there. So using that sort of framing of the difficulty of the operator to reach the customer in a direct journey, and then the difficulty of the customer to find that sort of trust and connection that they have with the right operator, this is how I want to frame what is in my tour operator community on the next slide, a very often debated, discussed, contested, uh, talked about uh, strategy, which is using an online travel agency. Um, I spend a lot of my time working with hundreds of operators every single week, every single day of my life. I'm connecting with operators and probably the number one question they have is, should I use an, should I use an OTA and which one should I use and why should I? And isn't direct sales, direct customer relationships so much better? The answer is maybe. <laughs> so in an ideal world, the OTA is creating essentially a point in the middle of these two pain points on the end that, that solves for both of the operators and the customer's pain points. They establish trust between the two parties through things like reviews and through a well-converting website that uh, is, is, is ranking high and um, has badges of authority. They take on the operator's burden of trying to reach out to a multitude of customers that are then also trying to figure out if they trust you as an operator. They're creating efficiencies in that customer's journey instead of trying to figure out across 100 websites which company is right for me, that customer is able to go to a single platform. And as the operator, rather than taking on the burden of all of that CRM backend uh, functionality, some of that gets offset by the customer management and support tools that the OTA offers. 
what they're ultimately doing is making it easier for a customer to book your tour, all for the low, low price of a commission. Um, why? Uh, on the next slide, just as a little asterisk, the OTA history is long and venerable, dating back to ye old ancient times from 1996. And you can see that the OTA journey has been going from flights and cars and things that are a little bit easier to understand up into now, more recently, the world that we live in, which is the world of tours and activities with uh, platforms like Tour Radar and Viator. Why are we as tour and activity operators later to the game? We're just harder to organize or harder to create coherent ecosystems around because our products are often so much more complex or different from each other and working locally in much different types of environments. And African safari is much different than a cultural heritage tour of the American South, which is certainly different than a 30 day adventure uh, across uh, the Silk Road, let's say, both operationally and from a sales and marketing standpoint. So. Now that we do begin to enter into uh, a, a, a sort of a digital awakening of the multi-day space, day tours were worked on earlier, but with companies like Tour Radar and others, the multi-day space is a, is a new horizon. And uh, the question that I get asked is, is this a horizon for me as the small or medium operator? It's a different question if you are Globus or the Travel Corporation or Colette, if you're in this room, that's certainly a much higher level strategy and it makes sense in a very different way. In my community of tourpreneur, I really want to talk uh, specifically to the smaller and the medium operators. And on the next slide, I've created a series of questions to ask yourself. This is my little cheat sheet checklist for you to figure out whether it is going to make sense for you to work with an online platform or whether it makes sense to go that more complex but more direct route of, uh, that I expressed earlier. First of all, do you need more customers? Some of you might be screaming, yes, that's obvious. Others of you might say no. For example, the tours that I operated for a long time across Europe were 10 people maximum and they were quite expensive tours. I didn't need to have my tours listed in 100 places in order to gain those customers. In fact, my entire strategy was around creating a tribe that wanted to continue talking to me, traveling with me. And so I had a community based approach to continuing that customer journey. If you need more customers, then an OTA solves that, that link. Second question, are my tours are appropriate for this platform? It is not good business, business strategy to be listed across 37 platforms just because you think that that's going to hopefully net you bigger, better, different customers somewhere. You need to do it strategically to make sure that there's market fit for where you're being listed. Um, that's first of all, just a big hassle to keep up with being listed on so many platforms. Make an intelligent decision, meaning that you look at the platform and say, yes, this is the type of essentially retail front that I want to be listed in, the store that I want to be a part of. Can I afford to be an OTA? This is gonna be in a little bit my final part of this discussion. You better have a pricing strategy that makes sense for that commission. In other words, you should hopefully not be a hobby in which your goal is to travel to Italy for free, but to be a business that has allocated certain percentages for sales and marketing, certain percentages for, uh, uh, for your own salary, things that make sure that you're running truly a business because the commission, if it's worked into your pricing strategy is an easy ad, uh, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Conversely, can I not afford to use an OTA? And that's my next question. Am I wasting too much time and money trying to sell through social media? through PPC ads on Google, through uh, content marketing, which takes up so much time. That all is costing you time, uh, which is costing you money. So it's not commission versus free. Uh, that free is actually costing you in a lot of different ways. Is my potential customer using this platform? Imagine I have an African safari and I've listed it on a platform that sells a lot of African safaris. However, they might be a budget safari operator and you might be selling a luxury safari, which means your 17,000 euro uh, trip is in a marketplace of 3,000 euro trips. And I see this 
fairly often, um, that's not doing well for your brand and that's not connecting with the right customer. My final point to ask yourself in this strategy sort of boot camp we're having here is do my platforms, terms, and conditions work for my company? This is very big. Uh, the platform needs to make decisions that are in the service of the customer uh, in terms of when you can cancel, how much money you get back, things like that. As an intermediary, their job is to both reward you and connect with you as a valuable partner, but also to serve the customer's interests or nobody wins. So can you afford with your vendors to accept the terms and conditions or is it too risky for you? Now, in the final minutes that I have, what I wanna do is drill down into two of what could be an entire day's worth of best practices in this realm. Uh, the two that I've selected are one, your tour product page, and two, your pricing strategy. So let's start with your tour product page, which is my next slide. Your tour product page, when you are working with a platform and not with your website, is essentially similar to having your own giant storefront versus having a table in a large marketplace or a bazaar. What's the difference? It's the amount of space you have to connect with your customer. On a website, you have an about page, you have room for videos, you have room to take them on a deep journey, uh, to connect with them and offer them personal lead magnets, to do all of these ways that we as multi-day operators create that relationship. When you are one product in a marketplace, then you have much less real estate, which means you need to use it much better and you need to use it incredibly intelligently. The first thing is uh, I've written there, customer and emotion focused copywriting. Your copywriting serves two masters in the space of an OTA listing. One is our master and overlord Google because Google is, uh, Google is scraping these websites to make sure that those optimized listings show up in the right rank in the right place and your partner is going to often be one that helps you to optimize for SEO. However, in the long run, it's still a customer, a human being that is pressing that book now button, which means the other side of your tour product listing needs to be emotion focused copywriting. Is Donald Miller's um, Building a Story Brand. It's a very easy read with a very powerful message, which is to use the narrative arc and sort of ancient human ways in which we do storytelling, which is through taking a customer on a journey, making the hero, making you the guide, identifying points and ways that you solve it. All of that storytelling needs to go into your product listing. I do a whole session on that, but what that does is begin to create a connection that says when that browser is browsing that you are the tour that I want to take. Not only based on reviews, not only based on price, but based on that bond that you're starting to forge in this small space. The second thing is photography. If you see the example of the listing that I've made on my slide right there on the right, already that Thailand adventure is reading as an adventure to me. We are on a bridge that might break at any moment and I've got my helmet on and I'm uh, tied up. That is giving me a sense of thrill. It's not generic jungle. But when you're taking these carousel images as a whole, you're creating a storytelling journey that is leading me into the adventure that you're trying to sell. That photography is the most human way that we're actually connecting with our guests because we receive so much more visual information than we do from reading. Um, and then finally, your review strategy. Reviews don't just happen with crossing your fingers. They become a designed part of your tour aspect. When I used to be a day tour operator in New York City, um, at the end of my tours, we would do a restroom break and we'd do it by a fountain in Washington Square Park in Greenwich Village. And right before that time, I would tell the story of how the tour is coming to an end. And, and I am originally not from New York City, but from the state of Wisconsin. And my old grandmother, uh, she sits in the nursing home and the one joy she gets every day is the nurse comes in and she reads the reviews from my previous day's tours to grandma. And grandma sits there and just feels 
proud of her grandson off in New York and it brightens her day. I tell that story. I've set my guests next to a fountain where they have their free time. I give them a QR code or a link to write a review if they would like. And then they also have a restroom break. So they have some free time. What I've done is design a scenario in which they feel motivated by emotion. Nobody wants to disappoint my grandmother. Uh, they, they're motivated by emotion to write me a great review. I'm intentionally designing my experience for the types of results that I need as a sales strategy. In other words, I need good, good photography, so maybe I'm going to hire a professional photographer to create staged kind of editorial style photojournalistic experience photos um, to make sure that it's the quality to connect with my guest. On your tour product page, that is a very important thing. Next, and almost final, is your pricing. Your pricing strategy needs to make sense, and that needs to start with having your numbers in order, understanding what your costs are, understanding what your fixed operational costs of your business are, and not just the tour costs, paying yourself a, paying yourself a salary, and then looking at that sales and marketing allocation, how much you're spending on um, PPC, how much you're spending on, on Facebook ads, whatever it is, and asking yourself, how much does that add up to? And if it's somewhere in the neighborhood of a commission, then you can suddenly make a strategic decision to allocate a certain number of sales to an OTA play. It doesn't need to be one or the other, and it can be strategic, and you can try it little by little by placing a certain tour on a platform and seeing the performance versus the hard work that you and your team are putting in on that, on that, on, on, on that, on that direct side. Now, what I do want to advocate for, though, is something connected to what I was talking about with building in a designed experience, and that's going from cost-based pricing, where you just look at what your fixed costs are and then add 30% to it, versus value-based pricing. Value-based pricing is something very different. It is pricing based on the perceived value that your customer has for your tour. Starbucks is great at increasing the perceived value. They are uh, the classic example of Joe Pine and Joseph Gilmore's The Experience Economy, in which a cup of coffee goes from being 50 cents at an American diner in New York City, where it's cheap and handed to you by a rude, uh, by a rude person, uh, to something that lives in a place where there's music, there's tables, there's steam rising, there's people naming you uh, when your drink is ready, there's the theater of the creation of the drink in front of your eyes. There's special hidden language around, uh, uh, around the sizes of the drinks. Just this morning in the Tourpreneur Facebook group, I posted a tour operator who, um, Shantiria Early of the Travel Divas, she creates little sewn on patches for her customers. Every time they take a trip, they earn a patch, kind of like a Boy Scout or a Girl Scout in the United States. And the more they have, the more they sew them onto their backpacks and they wear them as a badge of honor. What that's doing is starting to increase the value of the perceived experience where it's just a cheap patch, but it's forging community. It's creating a bond and creating a connection. That horse, down there in my photo on my slide isn't an accident. That's from something called the Significant Objects uh, uh, Project in which on eBay, they posted an image of that horse and they sold it at auction. And the price that they sold it for in the end was set by the customer. And they sold it for about one US dollar. Then they went back and they had a poet write a poem that was a mysterious poem about this horse going on a moonlight dry, a moonlight night ride. Uh, and it created an orb of mystery, of delight, of journey. Uh, and all of that was just a poem on eBay next to the horse. And when they had customers bid on that horse with that poem, they sold it for 103 US dollars. That is a pretty great return in what they added with storytelling and connection. Now, that's not the topic of this, of this talk, but it does tell you that the more you can create that perceived value, the more money then you, you have to play with an overhead, with, with an OTA strategy. So it doesn't feel like your margins are just getting tighter and tighter and tighter. 
We're in the experience business. And as I said at the beginning of this, we should focus as much as possible, both on sales and strategy as the design behind it. Apple has done that to fantastic value. Um, and so have so many other customers. That multi-day customer is a highly valuable customer for you because you can keep them for life. In my final slide, I just have some final tips for you as we close this out. Whether it's looking at all of this strategy from um, you know, a wide angle or whether it's zoomed into a certain thing, uh, I invite you to just get started on this journey. Start by reading the experience economy or building a story brand. Join our free Facebook community and start to ask questions because every multi-day operator is very different. I've run student travel multi-day companies. I've run high-end luxury multi-day multi operator companies. I've run companies that cater to backpackers. And for every single one of those companies, it's a different answer. And so your answer isn't going to come from the cloud by Googling, should I or shouldn't I uh, do this or that aspect of an online sales strategy? It comes from you, first of all, knowing your customer. What do they want out of this adventure? And where do they live? Where do they live online? How do they book tours? There are certain companies where their customer still likes to just pick up a phone and a phone call is really important to their customer journey. Others, that would be a deal breaker. Know your needs as a business. That's what I said before. Don't just follow the crowd down a certain path thinking this is where I should list because everybody else is. Know what your needs are, which means knowing your pricing and knowing how many customers you need and looking at that zoomed out sort of business strategy from an accounting perspective. Do your research and shopping. There are so many different ways to sell online, so many different types of platforms. There might be a right fit for you, but it comes first of all with understanding the lay of the land and um, as a sort of corollary, learning the industry, learning the lingo a little bit, understanding um, what this new digital world means in terms of kind of the platform economy that we live in and where you fit into it, understanding the language of sales and distribution and resellers and OTAs. That, informs you and makes you a better customer of those platforms. Diversifying your channels, making sure you have multiple diverse sales channels so that you can look at your business and know that it's not going to crumble based on one direction of the wind shifting in this industry. And then finally, don't change other lives at the expense of yours. We are in the joy and moment making business. Our job is to create delight for others. The delight that we create is life changing, but it should not be life ruining for you. If you are struggling and if this is difficult to navigate um, and on the next slide, uh, you can see just finally, um, I'm happy to talk to you. Uh, I'm happy to invite you to join our community. All we are is a group of operators globally trying to figure this all out. But I will say our multi-day world has been sorely in need of an event like this to sort of bring us all together and understand the global position that we are in as multi-day operators in the industry. So with that, thank you to Travis, to Christian, and to the rest of the Tour Radar team for having me and inviting me in to begin this dialogue with you all. Thank you.